Hello and welcome to the Varietal Show. My name is Rory and you are watching Varietal Literature's YouTube channel. We are a group of writers from Vancouver who just like to have fun with narrative. And what we're doing tonight <clears throat> is we are writing about a potato. Um, my partner sent me a picture of a book that was the Potato Through History or something like that. And it immediately gave me the idea that, you know, as the chat has already been pointing out, that the lowly potato is there for a lot of things. And I don't just mean a potato here, because there's lots of potato adjacent things that exist in other cultures, or potatoes are adjacent to them, um, that make up a staple food, right? So like taro and stuff like that. Um, and uh, yeah, basically what uh, I want to do today is I want to work with chat to just create potato based characters because <laughs> hey at some point you might need that basically we do live writing that's the short version of it if you're not watching this live down in the description below there'll be a little timestamps you can jump ahead to whatever it is you're most interested in from the show uh, including the final results of what our potatoes were like. Uh, let's see. Oh, it's a hop and chat tonight. Uh, Big Drew says, I love potatoes in all caps. So, you know, he's serious. Uh, the most versatile vegetable on the planet. Root vegetables are pretty versatile. Delicious in every form. Smothered in gravy, slathered in butter and sour cream. Covered in cheese, fried, baked, broiled. Potatoes! Potatoes are what love tastes like. I do like potatoes. I also like most food. And Jenna's here. Hello, Jenna. Says, hi, hi, here for potatoes. More love for potatoes goes on. Uh, GS says, someone craving carbs. <laughs> Always. Oh, and I see Rachel is here. Hello, Rachel. Lovely to see you. She says, I love potatoes in many forms. Let me know if your pronouns are not she. Um, <clears throat> the uh, varietal show. Yeah, anyways. What am I doing? The... Um, the one thing I do want to cover right before we totally get into it is, uh, I, like, I know, I know for people that tune in every week, it's getting a little dry, but a left on red to remind you that if you haven't yet, you should buy Francis Peck's The Broken Places and you should read up to the end of section two, which is the uh, end of chapter nine. Because next Wednesday at 6.30 p.m., we are going to meet, me and Avalon, and we're going to discuss uh, chapters 7, 8, and 9. If you missed it, uh, the other chapters were discussed in Season 1, Episode 1 of the Big Van Book Club on the Varietal Literature YouTube page. There's a, uh, a dedicated playlist for it. Um, but yeah, get Francis Peck's The Broken Places in the announcement video on pretty much every video to do with the Big Van Book Club, there are purchase links for physical and digital versions. And join us for the Big Van Book Club, Wednesdays at 6.30. That's my left on red. I will let it go at that. <clears throat> oh, it's the song I like. Okay, wait, 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 wait. First of all, we gotta go back. We're gonna restart it and it's gonna go a little louder and we're gonna do a little, little dance. And I encourage you at home you dance along with me. Because <laughs> wait, this has the funkiest little intro. Tell me that doesn't feel like a sunny day walk on the sidewalk. By the way, this song is called Manhattanite by Fruk. Uh, but if you guys ever wanted any of the playlists, I put the Spotify links in the description of the videos. So you can always come and listen to the various playlists. They're usually lo-fi, except for, of course, Fireside Fairy Tales, which is on Tuesdays. Anyways, <clears throat> um, now they're talking about vodka. <laughs> Big Drew says, I'm circling a petition to change this segment to left on red, spelled like the color. And have already just discussed the various shades of red. I could do that. Jenna says, I am down for jamming to tunes. Yes, the vibes are on point. Uh, Gia says, you're silly tonight. Uh, yeah, maybe. 
Maybe I just don't know how the potato characters are going to go and I'm, I'm killing time. Uh, but anyways, um, the point of this show really is to, to write with people. Because I know that writing can often be a solitary activity, but it isn't exclusively. And so one of the ways we do that is with hashtag. Does anyone do that anymore? That was like a thing for about a month in like 2011. Hashtag. Um, lit games, uh, which stands for literature games. And it's stuff where, like, sometimes it's an actual game where, like, people are messing me up and I'm trying to get through it. But, um, a lot more often it's just sort of writing together with the chat, which if you're here live, join the live chat and, uh, and write along with us. And what we're doing tonight is, um, <laughs> we're going to have historical potato characters which is like, I don't know if you could think of it this way, like Pixar potatoes. You know, if you were going to make characters through history that, that had witnessed great acts or something. Uh, I mentioned in the uh, advertising for this that um, the potato is the ultimate Forrest Gump. Because if you've ever seen that show, Forrest Gump, uh, which if you're, if you're of my generation, you couldn't have missed it. Uh, Forrest Gump's the basic idea that this person is... In the background of all the major events of like 1960s through to i think it's like the mid 80s or something where it ends um <clears throat> no nah, probably not even that late is it i don't actually know when it ended um anyways uh i just kind of like that concept as from the viewpoint of a potato uh, an anthropomorphic potato so there's sort of two ways we're going to approach it i'm going to be creating my own little potato characters in writing this is a writing show uh, but chat, you're welcome to create your own little character descriptions of various potatoes in history that you think should exist. All I will say is they need to capture potato-ness. Um, <laughs> they need to be distinctly potatoed. Okay. I'm leaving that as it is, just to see what people make of distinctly potatoed. Um... <clears throat> <laughs> Rachel says the heat will do that uh, about me being silly. Yeah, the heat is the thing here. Um, GS says, okay, is our potato a wise guy? Historical. Jenna says, I mean, the apple becomes relevant in Forrest Gump. Spoilers for Forrest Gump. Did it? God, honestly, I have not seen it since I was probably like 12 years old. I don't think I'm going to watch it again because honestly, I watched like a little bit of it when it came on TV maybe two or three years ago and I was like... This is a hell of a lot cornier than I remember. Um, how did this thing win uh, Academy Awards? Anyways, <clears throat> I'm not saying it's a bad show. I'm just saying I don't remember it being as corny as it actually is. So our first potato, you know what? I think it's time we pulled out our old friend, the, um, the Seven Sanctum generator because this feels like a real generator kind of day um if you've never been here before uh we occasionally Uh, we occasionally use Seven Sanctum, which is a wonderful generator of a million different things. Uh, and uh, it helps us write various stuff. Um, Genesis Lieutenant Advan Dan invests in apples and Forrest thinks it's an actual... Oh, in Apple, the computer, not the tech company. Yeah, see, like, I don't remember it being that corny, but it really was. This is a super corny show. Um, okay, so Greek sounding names. I'm all in for a Greek potato. Um, uh, Jonas uh, is not very Greek sounding. Legal, Legal Leus is good. Mazid Regrons, Regronis. <laughs> this is the problem with generated names, man. They don't sound like a thing. Uh, zero sought. Zero sought the Greek potato. Okay. 
How about our first potato is the unknown god of potatoes in the Greek pantheon, a sort of put upon potato. Um, I ask, like I'm not gonna just do it. <clears throat> Zerosat, our first character. Zerosat or Zaru, two friends. Was the Lord Almighty over potatoes from Mount Olympus? <clears throat> uh, yeah, I mean, um, uh, Greek potatoes is a thing. It's cooked in oil and, and, and lemon. Maybe we can evoke some of that, that, uh, that sour richness to it. So Lord Almighty over potatoes from Mount Olympus. Despite having one of the furthest reaches of any domain of a god. Even further. Further or farther? I think we... Yeah, it depends on what we mean by reach here, but let's go with farther just to um, his followers were fries, says Rachel. I love it. Love it. Um, <laughs> I already have, like, two ideas, and they're all stupid, and I love them. Uh, despite having one of the furthest reaches of any domain of a god, even farther than Athena herself. Zaru was not well respected. For he took the form of a oily, dripping, and soft potato. It was said it, he fell to pieces in combat. but would be mashed back whole by morning. His followers were known as fries. <clears throat> and aspired to become even just a sliver of his grand shiny form. They were known To wear cloaks made of potato hide. I like the idea of calling it a hide. That adds a gravitas to like potato peels that I've never had before. I honestly, I think I'm gonna start calling uh, potato peels potato hides. And if I like forget them on the counter, I'll be like, I'm tanning the hides. I'm gonna make some boots. <laughs> Uh, they were known to wear cloaks made of potato hide. <clears throat> and often worked. Uh, and protected, I know, and protected their ramparts. With barrels of heated oil. And refined... buckets of sea salt. Eventually, the strange cult of Potatoes the followers of 
Zaru. What is his whole name? Zaru Sot. Was pushed out of the Athenian. City limits and fled northwest, eventually settling in modern day France. Oh, I see Big Drew's already get, going here, so, um, uh, although they could be salty at times, Rachel says, the followers. It was a hot summer day just outside of Boise. Is that how you say that? I've only ever heard it in movies. I gotta be honest, your American town names, I don't all know them. The climate was perfect for our protagonist, Helithea von Russet, who was the queen of all things from Spudport on her territory's northern flank to Sauerkrem in the south. Hylithia one day grew weary of her reign and set out to conquer the neighboring village of Chive. <laughs> she ordered her fries to board their skins and float the Ranchero Sea into uh, I guess we haven't gotten the rest of that yet. GS says I love potato hides. I'm Mabel Mashmallow. <laughs> I'm dating poutine, Pete. I love it. Our Canadian fries with cheese curds and hot gravy. Oh, poutines. Oh, I see. I'll explain what a poutine is. Holly's House says this is far more advanced than as I was expecting for potato lore. Well, you've entered the potato lore zone. Sorry, guys. I have to restart the stream so that I have a graphic for the potato lore zone. <laughs> potato lore zone. As if I could make it even if I could. Like... I can't animate these things. It would take me an entire day and it would look like a child did it with crayons. Um, <clears throat> okay. So that's Zarosat and that's the origin of the French people as French fries. <laughs> it feels like that's probably offensive. I don't know. Um, I feel like I'm, I'm riding a borderline there. There's probably, I'll probably find out that like that's actually a really bad thing or whatever else who knows um <clears throat> okay uh so what else what else do we want what other kind of potatoes do we like i mean there's baked potatoes <laughs> okay no i'm gonna do it i mean i think half of you are probably already there we're gonna do a stoner potato because he's a baked potato <laughs> i need a stoner name <laughs> <laughs> if you have a name for a stoner potato we're gonna do it's not as deep lore i know i said to do like historical stuff but i love the idea of like a burnout potato um uh, let's go back to our Also, yeah, for the, you guys in the chat, keep giving me your potato lores. Let's see what kind of characters we can come up with. I know GS, um, Mabel Mashmallow is dating Poutine Pete, which are two great names, by the way. What is their conflict? Does she find him too saucy? <laughs> Sorry, um, <laughs> that's, that's the end of the episode, bye. <laughs> I'm kidding. Too saucy is about as good as I'm gonna do for puns, though. Uh, okay, weird name generators. Um, let's see what weird name, or these are like weird titles. Yeah, that doesn't work. Dark elf names, goblin names. Is there just like normal names here? Western names could work. Let's see what Western is.
Corey's pretty good. What's another term for potato? Corey something. Like, it's got to be, like, I know, like, Corey spud, but it's maybe something less obvious. <laughs> okay. Um... <laughs> Uh, Jenna says, hmm, token tots? <laughs> like, toking? <laughs> I mean, obviously, it's toking tots. The baked potato. I mean, I suppose I could tie it in a little bit. <clears throat> Toking was uh, oh, I see. Rachel uh, says um, oh, uh, crinkle and waffle cut fries. Oh, oh, yeah, those are good ones too. We'll have to do something with crinkle. I feel like there's something there with crinkle. So if somebody in chat wants to take the 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 baton and crinkle, you can go for it too, or I can do it after this one. Uh, uh, Rachel also says, Brown Eyed Pete, he always has a soft spot for the ladies. Um, Toking was the family um, failure. He was descended from a royal line. of the finest french fries of the potatoist grouping of the potatoist group of villages of villas <laughs> and the rich and elegant history of the Violet Taros. But Toking Tot did shame to the proud <laughs> Tot family name. By doing little with what? What's the name I gave it? Zerosot. What Zerosot gave him. Or at least that's what his father, Sir Tater, taught the eight. I think you just could put eight. Certainer dot the eighth. A pure blood taught to his to the earliest of the taught line. Tracked to the earliest, I should say. But well, his sister was a pioneer of the um, the fried taught. And his cousins were great boutonniers.
on the... Oh. <coughs> Some great poutineers on the frontier of potatoes in the new land. Toking just laid on the beach until one day he found he was baked. He enjoyed a clean vodka and toking. Perhaps his name was a prophetic or just a self-fulfilling one. Anyways. He was always pleading that he just needed to borrow some money for sour cream and they'd see what a legend he was. But every time he'd forget to get the sour cream and they'd find him back out on the beach. Sipping and toking like the big old baked potato he is. I noticed that it didn't correct me on Putinir, so I'm starting to think that might be a word. Um, uh, big Drew is still constructing a... Uh, <clears throat> um, his story there in the far off village of Crinkle Lord Fingerling and his multicolored army of Yukon warriors heard of Halithia and her pillaging they were none too pleased and decided to set sail in the waffle fried fleet <laughs> um, Rachel says he was ascendant of the finest smoke descendant of the finest smoke uh, is that for my story, uh, Rachel? I can add that in. Sorry, I didn't see it. His uncle, Potato Pancake, was in and out of the recycling bin, much to the shame of the family, GS says. His only friend was old, was, uh, Uncle, um... Oh, what is it? Uh, Uncle Lotke. That's it. Uncle Lotke. A scrappy fellow that dug about in the remnants of dumpsters to paste himself together. They both sought for sour cream and they both just wound up frying on the beach. Jenna says this is fantastic, truly fantastic. Big Drew says, I'm doing the Odyssey and you guys are making me, just making me hungry. Um, I do have red potatoes currently in the larder. Oh, red potatoes are good. They're a nice hearty one. Um, have a sour cream truck like we have an ice cream truck with music. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, let's do another character. Yeah, Drew, you're doing, like, a real story. I mean, I should be, I guess, 
given like the nature of it. But I'm kind of just enjoying creating characters that maybe could be a part of stories. I don't know. Maybe these characters could meet the Shagan. I guess most of the people in the chat know the Shagan, but for those who don't know, uh, a little while ago, because every so often we'll circle around and do various character building exercises, uh, we did a sheep dragon and we called it a Shagan. And we did actually two episodes about it. Uh, one of which was it got created in and the other one was an actual story dedicated to it. Um, we had a lot of fun with it. Um, it was, uh, it was this little, uh, sheep dragon, so, like, it breathed fire, but it was still a sheep. And, like, ever so often it would breathe fire on its wool and burn itself a bit, and you'd be like, meow. <laughs> uh, it was one of the best characters, uh, we've ever created, uh, with chat. Um, <clears throat> uh, GS is a female potato. Yeah, I was thinking that, too. <clears throat> um, what haven't we covered? We haven't done like a Jane Austen era potato. Like what would they do with that? That feels like the era of the overdone potato where it's like where if all food was done in such a way that it did not resemble the food. Um, and uh, I wonder if we can do something with that sort of a, 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 a like a, a pride and prejudice potato. Holly's house says Terra Tuber. <laughs> okay, Terra Tuber it is. Also, I'm going to ask this now because I always ask it at the end and then it's like way too late. Um, I'm kind of playing with the idea of sort of cycling through more predictable things each month. Uh, so, you know, with always some wild card stuff, but like, you know, the, 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 because it's kind of a few things I do. Like a writing prompt thing is one that we did that I would like to do again. We write a story off a writing prompt. It's pretty straightforward, but it usually winds up fun. The other one is sort of the Bob Ross thing, which is f focused on prose, really, and creating that. And we did that last week. That's sort of two out of, like, the four weeks in a month. So if there's anything else you guys feel like uh, you would want to come back to and, and do with me, uh, let me know today, and I'll sort of try to start to put a little bit more form to this strange show I do every Thursday. Big Drew has once again shown us all up with pride and potatoes. Uh, Terra Tuber of the most esteemed Tuber house. Of the most esteemed Tuber house. I actually don't remember if I finished Pride and Prejudice. So I'm not actually trying to do a spinoff of Pride and Prejudice because I probably don't remember it or even know it that well. But Pride... And potatoes. Jenna says, I was so sad I missed the Bob Ross thing because I really enjoyed that. Well, that's good because I'm planning on doing it more often. Uh, it is my probably personal favorite thing to do because prose is where I am most comfortable. Uh, for the early like years of me learning to be a writer, which was largely self-taught for a while there, um, my understanding of being a writer was being really good at prose. And so I got really obsessive about it for like a good decade, pretty much from like age nine to 19. Um, until I realized that you also need to have characters and plot. So like that was my twenties is figuring out character and plot. But, uh, for a while there, it was really just me writing these vignettes of description. Uh, Jenna says, I mean, you just need a really infuriating will they or won't they romance. But who is Tara Tuber as a potato? Remember, we need to capture distinct potato-ness. Is she that potato that, like, you put in the steamer and, like, it takes for some reason twice as long as every other one? Like, it's, you keep it in there and you're like, it's, I'm sure it's soft enough. And then you put that fork in it and it's still got tension in it. Is that Tara Tuber? Yes, this infuriating is the perfect word. You guys are really selling Pride and Prejudice here. I should go back and read it because apparently it's infuriating. 
<clears throat> um, okay. We got a yes, absolutely. The esteemed Tuber House was second to none. Certainly not the filthy tots down on the French coast. And certainly not even close to non-potato folk. And the matriarch of the Tuber ho household for the years Eight, mm, 1780 to 1820, let's say, <clears throat> was the stiff and starchy Terra Uber. By the way, I keep getting these sort of out-of-body moments where I'm like, what am I doing? Like, um... You know... The internet, this incredible invention of this, like, nice camera and lights dedicated over a year of my life to this. And what does it come to? Me writing about the starchy Terra Tuber. <laughs> Uh, Holly's house says she has a sprout sprout of potatoes never get offers of marriage. Yes Tara tuber Could hold up a roast For 12 hours and come out As firm as she went in She had the markings of green and the pale betrayal of white sprouts upon her flesh. She was unmarried and took the role of managing the more desirable tuber families members affairs <laughs> Jenna says listen we are all having a good time we are laughing that's what matters yeah try not to think too hard about it because I don't know if I'm really teaching you anything about writing at this point um, the skinless potatoes were the scandalous ones for sure. Yes, Je uh, Rachel, that's great. None. Truly. None. Would have known that Tara was wearing... gonna sound weird but I don't know another way to put it and make the pun work was wearing a skin piece a reflection of her hide once but she had undergone unuder gone like it's a typo but it's an amazing typo typo I think we should try to sell this to anybody else who comes into the stream as like the thing that like like an actual like greeting. We'll be like, oh no, we learned uh, a Finnish greeting from Rory. Uh, it's a neuter gone, a neuter gone. And she had undergone 
in a quiet alley in the darkest places of London. A de hiding. With the most unsavory and rusted peeler that the high seas ever did know. Okay, we have a pirate potato peeler now, guys. This is a pirate potato peeler kind of romance. Lisa says she's been peeled. Only unpeeled women are eligible matches. <coughs> um. <laughs> well, Victor, I'm obviously not gonna use that. Uh, the um. Uh, there's a request here to make them spicy. Oh, yeah, I think spicy will happen for sure. <clears throat> R Romero Belmont. Um, I I do like that name. Uh, Romero Romero Belmonte. It's like <laughs> just two and a half hours later. I'm pouring with sweat, but we've, like, written the first 30,000 words of a romance novel between Tara Tuber and Romero Belmont, the rusty peeler from the high seas. <laughs> Was a chance encounter for her. He expected to swing a little gold from a passing carriage of high potato society, but was shocked to find a fight with Tara Tuber. He was so taken by her power and fierce, stiff, <clears throat> let's change that to texture, and fierce, stiff flesh that they collapsed into a slow and elegant moonlit <laughs> Ollie's house says is this is a persuasion situation is the pirate a lost love from long ago you know what I think of when you say that I think of uh, the princess bride Uh, Rachel says, don't forget the stranger from down south, Senor Cajon, who likes to dip in salsa, <laughs> dancing now and then. Um, <clears throat> that will be maybe, uh, oh, how can I work him in? Maybe he's uh, uh, actually um, also dating the uh, peeler. Um, maybe it's a, a bisexual peeler. Um, <laughs> they collapse into a slow and elegant moonlit peeling. But he was a peeler <laughs> that lived as a leaf on the wind and was gone quickly. <laughs> For though he became something special to Terra Tuber. She did not know that few 
were special to Ramino. Ramiro, that's right. For how many he had along the passionate coast. He fled that day as he did from all pangs of love. To his salty bag of chips. Victor says, I'm having an off night. You couldn't possibly. I think you're having a great night. Um, well, unless you mean it by your mood. I mean, your writing is good. Uh, Senor Cajun Master of the Salsa and Scoop. <laughs> uh, Gia says, Rory, you're a secret russet romance novelist. Tonight at 6.30 on the Russet Romance Podcast. Like, if I want to write a weekly podcast about potato romance, then I'm going to write a weekly podcast about potato romance. I, I would do things like that, but I feel like I would run out of ideas by like week two. Like, in theory, it sounds good. All right, I'm getting super hot because it is quite warm. So, um, I am delighted by the fact that this worked out. I hope other people enjoyed themselves. We got to do that part where people who skip all our fun writing, um, just to listen to the ending. Um, uh, <clears throat> okay. Sorry, that probably deafened you. Let me get some water. I'll do the read back and then we'll look to end things. Hello, you're here because you want to just hear the results of what we came up with. And let me say, it really went south on me. There was a lot of strange choices made, but I think the last one is probably our best one. Uh, up there with the Shaggin, if you know what that one is. Um, we were just... It was the stupidest concept, which was just me saying, let's make characters based around potatoes. And uh, if I'm going to read my own back to you, but you guys should watch the whole thing because there was a bunch of great stuff in the chat, too. Uh, that is uh, we read out, too. That was a lot of fun. Um, <clears throat> but the first one was Zaru Sot or Zaru to friends. Was they lord almighty over potatoes from Mount Olympus, despite having one of the furthest reaches of any domain of a god, even farther than Athena herself. Zaru... Which is not hard, because it was just Athens. Um, Zaru was not well respected, for he took the form of an oily, dripping, and soft potato. It was said he fell to pieces in combat, but would be mashed back whole by morning. His followers were known as Fries, and aspired to become even just a sliver of his grand, shiny form. They were known to wear cloaks made of potato hide and protected their ramparts with barrels of heated oil and refined buckets of sea salt. I guess it should be buckets of refined sea salt. Eventually, the strange cult of Patatus, the followers of Zarosat, were was, were pushed out of the Athenian city limits and fled Northwest. Oh, I had pulled up here. Eventually settling in modern day France. So that one was just like background. What I particularly enjoy though is everything is consistent with that lore from now on. <clears throat> the next one was. <laughs> the next one was Toking Tots. The baked potato. Toking was the family failure. He was descended from a royal line of the finest French fries of the Patatas group of villas and the rich and elegant history of the Violet Taros. 
But Toking Tot did shame to the Proud Tot family name by giving little with what Zarasat gave him. Or at least that's what his father, Sir Tater Tot VIII, a pureblood Tot, tracked to the earliest Tot line, would often say. But while his sister was a pioneer of the fried Tot, and his cousins were great poutineers in the frontier of potatoes in the new land, Tolkien just laid on the beach until one day he found he was baked. He enjoyed a clean vodka and Tolkien. Perhaps his name was prophetic, or just a self-fulfilling prophecy anyways. He was always pleading that he just needed to borrow some money for sour cream and that they'd see what a legend he was, but every time he'd forget to get the sour cream and they'd find him back out on the beach sipping and toking like the big old baked potato he is. His only friend was Uncle Lotke, a scrappy fellow that dug about in the remnants of dumpsters to paste himself together. They both sought for sour cream and they both just wound up frying on the beach. Pride and Potatoes, which was Drew, I will give credit, that amazing name. Terra Tuber of the Most Esteemed Tuber House. The esteemed Tuber House was second to none. Certainly not the filthy tots down on the French coast and certainly not even close to non-potato folk. And the matriarch of the Tuber household for the year 1780 to 1820 was this st stiff and starchy Terra Tuba. Terra Tuba could hold up a roast for 12 hours and come out as firm as she went in. She had the markings of green and pale betrayal of white sprouts upon her fresh flesh. She was unmarried, uh, as would be expected, and took the role of managing the more desirable Tuber family members' affairs. But none, truly none, would have known Terra was wearing, whoops, was wearing a skin piece, a reflection of what her hide once was. But she had undergone in a quiet alley, in the darkest places of London, a de-hiding with the most unsavory and rusted peeler that the high seas ever did know. Ramiro Belmonte was a chance encounter for her. He was expecting to swing a little gold from a passing carriage of high potato society, but was shocked to find a fight with Terra Tuber. He was so taken by her texture and fierce, stiff flesh that they collapsed into a slow and elegant moonlit peeling but she he was a peeler that lived as a leaf on the wind and was gone quickly for though he became something special to terra tuber she did not know that few were special to ramiro for how many he had along the passionate coast he fled that day as he did from all pangs of love to his salty bag of chips, Signor Cajun, a master of the salsa and scoop. Tonight at 6.30 on the Rough Shit Romance Podcast. Uh, those are the ones we came up with. There's more in the chat, of course. Uh, Big Drew says, now I'm envisioning a romance novel with a partially peeled potato with long flowing hair on the cover. With a pirate peeler, remember? Rachel, that's the potato Hallmark movie we're all waiting for. Oh, I see. Rachel wrote a bit more here. Um, but nothing compares to the dignity of Master Ruffles who owns the ranch down the way. <laughs> Should one of her days just be making both potato romance? It'll be like the Bob Ross thing. Um, writing prompts. And then potato romance. <laughs> Once a month. We continue a new chapter of our potatoes. Um, Rachel says his skin would be oiled and tanned. Perfect. With extra butter. He had very green eyes. And curves in all the right places. Non-fat potato. Since we're in Europe, Irish potatoes should have been involved. Yes, that's true. There should have been Irish potatoes. <laughs> All right. Well, I am a, I have I have evolved to a shiny form. That's my joke about being sweaty. Um 
Uh, I enjoyed myself, so I hope others did too. I'm going to give you the outro that I haven't used in a while. I'll give you the intro I haven't used in a while. Um, I made this really for one thing that I did in November last year. And then I was like, ah, I really like this. So I'm going to use it again. It doesn't really fit the theme. Um, oh, Big Drew, you're right. You said in the, Big Drew says, I told you in the beginning, potatoes are what love tastes like. And that will be the catch line for the Russet Romance podcast. Potatoes are what love tastes like. And if you are an artist of a visual nature out there, I expect to see the covers of these potato books. Well, the romance ones anyways. Let's face it, that was the high point. Um, Rory, you've turned into a buttered baked potato. That is accurate much as that's probably unappealing i think baked potatoes are more appealing rachel uh says this was great well thank you rachel I, I had a lot of fun too and jenna also said this was fantastic it's great to see you again both jenna rachel gs holly's house and big drew um well as you know uh you don't have to go home but you can't stay here because i gotta cash out the bookstore which means get out of my shop I'll see you Tuesday at 6.30 for Fireside Fairy Tales, though. And remember to like and subscribe if you haven't already. Also, oh my god, I almost forgot. If you missed it, on Wednesday, there was an announcement video. It was pre-recorded. It's only five minutes long. Where I finally read the infamous Prince George poem. If you have never, uh, if you're new to this channel, sometime last year I said if I hit 50 subscribers, because I honestly didn't think I was going to do that. Um... <laughs> I would read this poem that I'd written, which was basically just me being very angry at this this northern city I was in working in. Um, I say more about it in the video. Uh, and I read the poem because we hit 50 subscribers, which is super cool. Thank you to everybody who has been supporting me, even recently or later. Um, go check out that video, and if you like it, please remember to give it a like. I won't hassle you this much if I ever become remotely successful, but in the early days, liking and subscribing is super important for ever being recommended anywhere by this terrible mistress that is YouTube. Now beyond that, for the first time in my life, I said the closing thing and then said more. Um, here is a nice, peaceful outro that I've only ever used once before on a nice beach. Get out of my shop. Thank you.